welcome back. We've been working really hard in the past 10, 12 lectures or so to build up the theory of symplectic geometry as a generalization. Well, the angle I'm taking in this course is that it's a generalization of Hamilton mechanics, Hamiltonian mechanics. And today, and in the previous lecture, and in the coming lectures, we're going to reap the rewards of all this hard work. And we're going to start to talk about generalizations of Hamiltonian dynamics. And like really huge generalizations that will find applications throughout physics and mathematics. And the first step on this way is to talk about the actions of Hamiltonians on symplectic manifolds and to understand their structure. And then we're going to take this structure and generalize it and then build the theory of moment maps, which is what's coming in the coming lectures. And those find, yeah, as I said, applications in a wide variety of subjects, not just limited to the classical realm. So lots of the stuff I talk about in this course is one of the uh, sort of fascinating points about this is you might think uh, classical mechanics is super boring. We, we know the world is quantum anyway. Let's just do quantum mechanics. And I have a lot of sympathy for that point of view. But it turns out that even quantum mechanics has the structure of a symplectic manifold. So that's a, super, you know, sort of a surprising fact. And that means we can apply everything we've learned directly to quantum systems. You will never see this in any textbook, but maybe I mentioned some applications later in this course. Uh, and as it turns out, there are a variety of places where people have applied the techniques of symplectic geometry to understand things like quantum entanglement or to to study path integrals and other things appearing in quantum field theory, for example. So there's lots and lots of reasons to, to, to want to study symplectic geometry, not just to like, build a lovely mathematical framework for classical mechanics. So the first part of this lecture is a little bit of a review. A review. One parameter subgroups of diffeomorphisms. So if we have a manifold and a vector field, and like always in this course, we're going to assume that the manifold is either compact or the vector field is complete so that we can integrate everything for all time. Let's suppose we have a manifold and a complete vector field. And then we also immediately associate to any complete vector field the flow corresponding to that vector field. And we also know that these are diffeomorphisms for any T. So very, very smooth maps that are invertible, and the inverse is also smooth. Another concept that we've introduced is that of the integral curve corresponding to an initial point. So let's P be a point in our manifold. And we denote by sigma t of p the image of this point under this flow and the union of all these points is the integral curve. So far, so familiar. Now, were M to be a symplectic manifold, we think about this point P not as like a position, but rather as a, a full specification of the state of the system, which would mean position and momentum. So P is like a position and a momentum of a symplectic manifold. 
However, we're not talking about symplectic manifolds just yet. It's just, just a normal old manifold. It could be odd dimensional. And I'll just collect together some statements about this flow that we've essentially all proven by now and they should be familiar and if not then they're a very easy exercise to, to uh, establish. So what do we know about the flow? Well I'll draw a little picture just to illustrate this. So Take the manifold M to be the, the surface of the three sphere, in other words, the two sphere. You could take a vector field on the, on the sphere, just being one that points in the easterly direction, and take a point on the sphere and the integral curve is a circle like this. It's a good example of a uh, a vector field on a manifold and its corresponding flow. So we know a couple of things about um, this flow. So we know that at time zero, the image of the point P under this flow is P. Okay, that's pretty good. We also know that this flow satisfies a differential equation. T. And we know a little bit more by appealing to exist uh, the uniqueness of a solution to ordinary differential equations, we actually know that this flow has a semigroup property. Pretty neat. And, well, hence, right, using this fact up here, we also know that the inverse, I don't know if I explicitly wrote this out yet, but that's definitely worth highlighting, that the inverse of this flow is just the same as evolving backwards in time for the same length of time t. And if you collect this all together, then we actually have a rather important corollary. It's, it's not. I mean, it's not rocket science once you see these, these two facts, but it's something that, that helps us in generalizing Hamiltonian dynamics to a more general setting. So the map, which takes a real number and hands you back the flow according to the vector field x for a time t, so this is a map, uh, is a, uh, isn't just any old map, it's a homomorphism. from the real numbers, which is a group, right? A bunch of things, you can add them, subtract them, take. And then diffeomorphisms of M is all the smooth maps of M to M. And the lovely thing about this flow is it respects the, 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 the group structure on R, the additive structure on R. It gives us a bunch of group, uh, a bunch of diffeomorphisms. And so this set here, the set of all of these flows, which are just exponential maps of the vector field. This is a uh, one parameter group of diffeomorphisms. So 
So in physicist work, language, we're just saying here that the flow behaves like you should expect something to behave if it's an evolution with respect to time of some dynamical system. So T, you can really think of T as time. So it could have gone wrong, it's sort of worth stressing always when, when you have something that looks nice, what could have actually gone wrong and made life really horrible. It could have been that this, this group property didn't hold. That could have been. And uh, it could have gone wrong, uh, you know, totally horribly wrong because, for example, it could have been that, that the flow with respect to T plus S wasn't the composition of the flow with respect to T than the flow of S, but some other two crazy maps. That actually happens. There's many, many examples of evolution systems where these kind of things happen. And one of them, sort of worth pointing this out, is if you define the map Ft equals sigma, say, T squared, that's no longer a group, or you know, even more pathologically, sigma root t, things like this. So the set of maps defined by, F, by, by such a, a flow here, they're obviously a flow, but they don't obey some of the natural conditions you would hope for an evolution with respect to time. And you know, it goes downhill from there, they can exist. We also know that there can exist flows if the vector field is not complete, where you can't even go past a certain time. It's a, it's sort of an abrupt end time beyond which nothing, the solutions no longer exist. And what we've seen so far right, in this course is that t, t is time. And these flows come from vector fields, and these vector fields come from Hamiltonians. We'll get to that. Now what we're going to do is like, it's like one of these Friday afternoon uh, fantasies. Imagine if there were two times. Imagine if there were three times. What kind of flows would you get out of that? It sounds like, you know, crackpot kind of questions. What happens if the two times don't even commute? So we're going to answer that question. We're going to talk about a generalization of flows where we have more than one time coordinate. And furthermore, these time coordinates don't even have to commute. So like, it, I, it's, it's challenging to think what that means operationally if you interpret t really as a time. Actually, we'll see that the, there's very natural interpretations of these things. Uh, in many, many different physical contexts. If you just insist on calling this parameter t, however, you're in fact some kind of difficulty in interpreting it. So the trick is, you know, when you generalize anything, is to say, what is that feature that I like? And how do I abstract that out and then study that? So the feature that we want to take out from vector fields and flows is maybe not the vector field part of it, but the fact that this is a, one, a group homomorphism part. That's the part that we're going to take away from these observations and abstract to a much more general setting. So here we go. We got, we got a group. R is a group. We have used that word several times. It's not any kind of group. It's a nice smooth group. It's a Lie group. And this flow here is a map from one Lie group to, oh, look, another one. So diff M is actually an infinite dimensional Lie group. So maybe if we want to generalize everything we've seen, Maybe the right way to do it is to take that groupiness aspect and generalize this corollary. And that's what we're going to do. So what's the, uh, the right sort of groups to look at? Well, there is no right groups, actually. So uh, we're going to focus on Lie groups in this course. But why do we stop there? You can put anything you want there. Any group. There's lots of them. Finite groups. Infinite groups. Free groups. There's no, no reason to restrict to Lie groups, except that actually that's about the right amount of structure that allows us to generalize in a nice way the things we've already seen. But if you want to replace things with the integers, like you know some 
discrete infinite group, then be my guest, you can. And you will be able to, to generalize some of the things we've seen. But what we're going to do is Lie groups. So I'm going to tell you what they are. I mean, I assume, I mean, you've all had a physics training. You would have heard these words at least once or twice before. But I'll tell you what they are. Again. Just so we have a clean reminder on the board. So a Lie group, what is it? Well, it's a manifold. So it's not just a group, it's also a manifold. A manifold that is a group. That's still not a Lie group. A manifold that is a group is not a Lie group because it could be that the group operations weren't smooth or continuous or, or you know, anything, right? So you've got two group operations. One is the group product, which takes two elements from the manifold and gives you another one. So that's multiplication or composition or product rule. I'll just use dot. And you've got another group operation, namely taking inverse. Once you know how to do those two things, then you can get the whole group. And product A, B, and inverse is A goes to A inverse. So you have these two maps here defined on the, the manifold. And it's a Lie group when these things are smooth. Smooth maps. Whenever you restrict a definition like that to say smooth maps, you should always wonder, well, what about just one times differentiable maps or con just continuous maps? And you get a, uh, a generalization, this topological group notion when you do that. And then you say, what about discontinuous maps? And then you get all kinds of crazy stuff. But as I said, we'll focus on Lie groups because that's where that's where the structure of the Lie group plays nicest and fr friendliest with the things we've just studied already. But if you're a physicist, you should be always questing and thinking, is this the right notion? Just because I like the, the derivative operator, does that mean that the Lie group is the right definition to study? Well, you need an operational argument for why derivatives are good. And actually, we don't have one. If you do fundamental physics and you think about gravity, then at some point, you'll start to worry about whether or not space-time is continuous at all. Because there's a couple of really compelling thought experiments that you're probably familiar with to do with black holes that really rev you know, force us to think about what is What's the operational meaning of space and time? And it's an idea that's certainly been around for a while that neither space nor time are in fact continuous and that continuity is an emergent phenomena. So ultimately, maybe the right way to generalize things is just to have a group and to study somehow continuum limits. Well, I'd love to talk about that, but I won't. Let's talk about some examples of Lie groups before we get into our generalizations. So the first Lie group is one we've already met, is the real numbers themselves under the addition operation. They're also a group under product as well, as long as zero is excluded. S1, the circle, we've met that one before. That's also a Lie group. And we 
have a name for this group S1, that's uh, the group of norm one or absolute one complex numbers under the usual product from C. We call that U1 alternatively. I'm sure you've met that before. And that is also the same as SO2, which we'll meet in a second. So SO2 is the group of two by two real symmetric matrices. Real orthogonal matrices, sorry, with determinant one, so rotation. Then we have the unitary group of n by n matrices. And it's sister SUN, the set of special unitary matrices, which is just the determinant one subgroup of UN. And we have the orthogonal matrices, ON, these are the groups as well. And it's sister SON. And the biggest one of all is GL of N, the set of invertible N by N matrices. This is not all examples of lead groups, but this captures pretty much all of them. I'm missing out the symplectic ones. It's a bit ironic in this course, I suppose. Symplectic matrices, 2N by 2N matrices, which preserve a symplectic two form and a couple of exceptionals. And then that's more or less all the Lie groups there are to know. Well, we don't have time in this course to cover like the classification of Lie groups and so on. Instead, what we're going to do, well, this is the finite dimensional Lie groups. Of course, if you go infinite dimensional, then, then you open Pandora's box and all kinds of craziness comes forth. So let's um, not actually dwell on classifying and understanding Lie groups. We're just going to accept that these are the interesting ones and work from, the here, work from there. Instead, we're going to be focused on what on a problem that's much more relevant to physics, directly relevant to physics, namely finding representations of these abstract groups over here. These are just abstract entities that obey some rules. And it's not physics until you can find a representation of one of these abstract things on a physical system. And a representation is a symmetry. So let's uh, talk about those instead. So what is a representation? of a Lie group or of any group. We need a vector space. That's what we call a representation, right? You take some abstract group, G, and you find a way to make a matrix corresponding to element, every element of the group G, such that those matrices obey exactly the same group law as the original elements. We're going to be focused on representations of Lie groups in this course. Sort of. In fact, I'm going to a little bit move sideways 
before we get into the representations. We're going to talk about what you could think of as like a generalization of representation. Namely, actions. You know, sometimes the thing that defines your physical system isn't a vector space, but say a symplectic manifold. So in quantum mechanics, what defines a physical system is a vector space, namely a Hilbert space. And you have, a, a, a you have some group of symmetries, and that's a representation that gets represented on your physical system. If you can find a bunch of unitary matrices acting on your vector space, your Hilbert space H, that respects the group law. So that's how you implement symmetries in quantum mechanics. However, in symplectic geometry, the set of states isn't a vector space necessarily, right? Our set of states is actually a symplectic manifold. So we have to have a slightly different notion if we want to represent our symmetries on our physical system. Namely that of an action. So if you have a Lie group, then you want to find something analogous to GLV, right? GLV is a set of things that you can do to your set of states. And the set of things that you can do to your states, so to speak, are diffeomorphisms, ways of taking a point on your manifold and giving a new point on the manifold. So an action is just the analogous notion to that of a representation. You associate to each element of the group an operation of your set of states. So diff M is analogous to GLV here. Now, if you let M, your manifold, be the vector space in this, this notion here, so let M be the vector space V up there, then GLV is a subgroup of diff M. You can see this is a, some kind of generalization of representation when you've lost the vector space structure. So if you have a smooth action of a Lie group on a manifold, then you have a thing called an evaluation map associated to that. What does it do? Well, it takes an element of the group G and a point of the manifold M, and it takes you to the result of applying psi G to that point M. is how it works. You take a point and a group element and that goes to psi g p.
and this action is smooth if this map here from M cross G to N is smooth. So you can differentiate everything any number of times. And we know one example already. So if x is a complete vector field, then the flow associated to x is a smooth action. smooth R action. Okay, I haven't mentioned the word symplectic anywhere so far. We're going to get to that. Before we do so, I'll just notice a correspondence. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence between complete vector fields. This works so we know one arrow if we have a complete vector field on a manifold M then we know how to get a smooth R action on M it's easy but it turns out we can go back the other way right and that's the easier direction in a sense So if you have a smooth R action on M, you can go back the other way by just differentiating it. And that gives you a vector field corresponding to the action. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between smooth R actions and complete vector fields. So we've already seen this in previous lectures. So we've assembled now a very suggestive bunch of definitions. We've abstracted the notion of time away to a smooth action, in case of this case of uh, manifold smooth R action. And we've, we've spoken about Lie groups as though a, that's a candidate for generalizing time. But we haven't mentioned the word symplectic anywhere. So Symplectic manifolds being a generalization of phase space, they ought to be there ought to be a way to make all of these notions compatible with the symplectic structure. And indeed there is. 
So let m omega be a symplectic manifold. You can take as your favorite example phase space. And now we take a Lie group. And suppose we have a uh, smooth action of our Lie group on the manifold M. So if you just take, I don't know, a random smooth action of a Lie group on a manifold, then things aren't likely to be very nice. Because these diffeomorphisms here most likely don't preserve the symplectic two-fold. They're not symplectomorphisms, they're just diffeomorphisms. Now the symplectic two-form is a thing that gives symplectic, uh, is what distinguishes symplectic geometry from normal geometry. It's this notion of oriented area that in phase space sort of tells us that what is the uh, action of a region in phase space. And you don't want to destroy this two form, this symplectic structure. So it's sort of natural at this point to say, okay, if we've got a smooth action, let's suppose that this is a nicer action than your average diffeomorphism. Let's suppose that this smooth action actually goes not from G to diffeomorphisms of N, but to a subgroup of the diffeomorphisms, namely the symplectomorphisms. They're the, the natural ones, the natural maps of a symplectic manifold to itself. And that's a very special action. And that's what we're going to call a symplectic action. So this action is symplectic. Well, it's symplectic if psi maps not from the group to just the diffeomorphisms, but just the simpler symplectomorphisms of N. Remember, every symplectomorphism is a diffeomorphism, but not other way around. And these are the ones that are interesting for physics. So symplectic actions are very interesting. They preserve uh, the notion of uh, position and momentum, if you like, in phase space. <coughs> and we have from a couple of lectures ago, a one-to-one -one correspondence between symplectic actions and symplectic vector fields. And this is really, this is fantastic because it allows us to take what is apparently some horrible, disgusting global notion and reduce it to a local notion that we can check locally. Do we have an action that's symplectic or not?
at least in the case of the real numbers. We're going to work co correspondingly harder to get a correspondence here when this is a different Lie group acting on the manifold. Now, I've said symplectic actions. Now, that's, you know, so this is it in some sense. We're, we're kind of done with this definition. We have a way to talk about representations on our space of states. So M is our space of states. G is our Lie group, a group of symmetries of our systems, a time translation symmetry, which you can upgrade to, say, space time translation symmetry, which you can upgrade to, say, Poincaré invariance, or whatever group that you like. We have a way to talk of its action on the space of states, which respects the structure of our space of states. And we're, we're kind of done with that definition. And in some sense, that's fine, right? So symplectomorphisms are really, in, in a lot of ways, they're a kind of nice, they're nicer than Hamiltonian actions because you just check them locally. You, you just know whether or not you have a symplectic vector field just with a local condition. You don't have to look at the topology of the manifold or anything like that. And in a lot of ways, symplectic, you know, what's wrong with calling symplectomorphisms evolutions in physics? There's nothing that I'm aware of that's particularly wrong with that, except that you lose the notion of the Hamilton, Hamiltonian, which is like this energy constant. And that corresponding conserved charge being the Hamiltonian is obviously very important if you want to move to quantum mechanics and quantize these notions. So what we're going to do is look at the appropriate notion of a symplectic action which has an, a Hamiltonian corresponding to it. Now that's sort of easy to, to understand what that can be in the case of our actions. We've worked that out already. A symplectic uh, vector field is Hamilton. We know what condition that is. Right? We know when that's true got to do with this first cohomology group. But what about a Lie group? What does it even mean, Hamilton, for a Lie group acting on a manifold, on a symplectic manifold? It's as if you have some number associated to some function associated to the Lie group everywhere. How does that even work? So we're going to try and pull apart that puzzle. We'll come up with a very satisfactory answer by the end of tomorrow, the next lecture. Before I get onto that, we'll do some examples. To illustrate the notion of a symplectic flow. So the first one, symplectic action, sorry, is just phase space R to the two N. It should be your first place now to look for any examples. And the symplectic two form is just this one. Am I using x's and y's? Yes, I am. So we have a symplectic two form. And let's choose some complete vector field. So the most obvious one maybe is just minus d, d, y, one. This a vector field that you can choose. And the orbits, the integral curves with respect to this flow, are just straight lines. And the Hamiltonian is, there is a Hamiltonian. It's just x1. Okay, so that's a symplectic, a group of symplectic, uh, an action, a symplectic action of R on a symplectic manifold. Very simple action.
couple more examples before we continue. It's a very simple Hamilton, Hamiltonian, simple symplectic action. Let's take a slightly more interesting example. I'll just do it for R2. With a Hamil and we'll generate our symplectic vector field from this Hamiltonian here. Okay, that one should be familiar. It's a harmonic oscillator. And so if you take the internal product of xh with omega, you better get dh is x dx plus y dy, which means that xh is y d dx minus x d dy. We've already studied this vector field before. We know this is a symplectic vector field. And we know its orbits, right? This circles the phase space. So the vector field points like this. And now what's interesting about this symplectic action on R2 is that it's not only an R action, but it's also another group action on this manifold. So it's a symplectic R action. But also, Because these curves join up after two pi units of time in suitable units, then it also gives us symplectic U1 action. On M. Kind of cool. You can have simultaneously several different actions on a group on a manifold depending on the trajectories. Third example will be hardly different from the first two, except that it'll be compact. So there's this miraculous example of a symplectic manifold, namely the two sphere, which doesn't generalize, but it's still a nice example. So there we've also met in some symplectic vector fields on the surface of the two sphere or the three sphere, sorry. So if we take the two sphere and we give it angle height coordinates, and we introduce this symplectic two form we've met in a previous lecture and then we choose this symplectic vector field here dd theta So 
Hamilton, Hamiltonian for this vector field is h, the height function. And so we get a um, symplectic r action and a symplectic u1 action again. And this R or U1 action is just rotate by, by T. And because this, the sphere is, you get the same thing when you rotate by 2 pi, then this is also a U1 action. And we also would assume uh, instead of this height, now the other angle. Yes. Uh, would we then uh, get um, the field uh, as a free action? Oh, okay. So the question is, if we add, uh, if we add to it, the angle as well. Oh, if instead of the Hamiltonian being the height function, we chose h is the theta. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, I mean uh, the coordinates. Instead of instead of angle, uh, so instead of theta in h, we use uh, theta and phi, for example. Oh, okay. So if instead of theta and h, we use theta and phi, the two different angles. Would what what? Would we then obtain a smooth SO three action? Would we obtain a, a smooth SO three action? Well, not as written here. So the, what we've got here is we've got this symplectic vector field x. You know, it, this is all coordinate invariant. You, you know, I use coordinates to present the, everything up to the orbits, but then, you know. And so you, you only get a one parameter group action every time this way. So whenever you have a Hamiltonian, you, you get one sort of the correct vector field corresponding to that Hamiltonian, and you get a one parameter group. Now we certainly want to go in the direction of having a, an SO3 group action, but then like you have to answer the question, well, how do I, what do I put here? So if I have one Hamiltonian, I only get one vector field. So if I want to do SO3, then I know I need to be able to rotate around that axis, that axis, and this axis. So I need something like three Hamiltonians. And that's exactly what we'll do. We'll actually find a way to introduce a notion of Hamiltonian for, for SO3 actions and all other Lie group actions. And it'll have a special name. It'll be called the moment map. So it'll happen to next lecture.
so we can understand what symplectic actions are Hamilton or not when the Lie group in question is S1 or R. So the answer is a symplectic, symplectic action is Hamilton if when you find the vector field from the smooth action psi and you check if it's Hamilton, you find that it is. And so this is and an equivalent way of saying that is that there is some function on the symplectic manifold such that when you find its vector field generated by that function, according to that recipe there, then it's precisely the one that generates the flow psi. Yep, a question. Meaningful question at this point, why we choose these two? Is it a meaningful question to uh, why we choose S1 and R? I think I'll make a comment about that. R we choose because we like, we're yeah. thinking of time. So, And S1 is, if you like, thanks to this Arnold Leville theorem of the, the previous lecture. Oh. So if we saw in the previous lecture that uh, lots of symplectic actions on symplectic manifolds, that the integral surfaces sort of break down to copies of S1 and R. So there's no other possibilities if you want to think about time acting on the manifold. Of course, it is artificial still because, as I said, we're going to go upgrade our group of symmetries from time translations to include other actions. So there is no particular reason why we stick to that. It's just this is the easiest generalization we can get for free at this point. All right, next one. So we can see that if we want to upgrade these notions to the more general Lie group setting, if we want to somehow come up with a notion of a Hamiltonian for a Lie group, we're going to need to deal with more than one vector field. Because you, if you just think about, say, SO3, so the group of rotations, corresponding to every one parameter subgroup of SO3, every rotation, rigid rotation, you could talk about a corresponding Hamiltonian like this. So that's an infinite number of Hamiltonians, right? Because you can rotate rigidly around any particular Euler angle. And so that's somehow you need an infinite number of Hamiltonians, naively speaking, in order to talk about a Hamilton action of SO3. Of course, you should already smell that that's not the case right? because Somehow there's only three independent coordinates specifying an element of SO3. It's a three-dimensional manifold SO3. So. so maybe you only need three Hamiltonians. And what would they be? They'd be the ones that generate, say, rigid rotations around one angle, around a second angle, and a third angle. And then all the rest can somehow be generated from that knowledge. Just know how to generate those three vector fields, and you're good, right? That's, ha that's how it should work. And indeed, that's exactly what happens. So. You can answer all these questions locally in Lie groups. So the nice thing about a Lie group, as we'll see, is that if you, uh, you can answer everything about a Lie group by just knowing what happens near the identity of the Lie group. So we're going to do exactly that now. We're going to start to study groups near the identity, and we'll see that we can introduce a notion of Hamiltonian by just looking at what happens near the identity.
So now we have to talk a little bit about Lie algebras and their connection to Lie groups. So we've already met Lie algebras, but now we're going to connect that abstract discussion to the more concrete discussion of Lie groups. So let G be a Lie group. And let little g and big G just be some element of our Lie group. Now, G is a group. And that means that we can multiply smooth map. And so, given our element G, we can build a map from the group to itself. And that, group, that map, what does it do? It just takes an element of our group and multiplies it on the left with G. It's, it's a bona fide map. Smooth map, by definition. So that's the map called left multiplication by G. A map from G to G. But it's an action, right? It's, it's something, it's, it's taking, it's an action of G on itself. Given to us by the multiplication map. Now, if we have an action of a Lie group on a manifold, be it self or some other manifold, then we can talk about vector fields which don't change when you do this. Invariant vector fields. field. So if you have a vector field on the manifold and you do this map on the manifold, well then you can push forward that map to do something on the vector field. And if that vector field is left invariant, then it's left invariant. And there's a similar right notion. <coughs> now, there's a very nice thing to note about left invariant vector fields. If you have one left invariant vector field and another one, and you take their sum, you get a left invariant vector field. So it's closed under linear combinations. And so that 
makes us think of introducing the vector space of all left invariant vector fields. special manifold that we like to act on, we like to let the group act on itself. So we introduce in that context the vector space of all left invariant vector fields. So with the Lie bracket, we learn an even more remarkable fact, namely that if you take two left invariant vector fields, form their Lie bracket, you get another one. And that's a consequence of something we've noted earlier for the Lie bracket, I think. That means that our vector space G is actually a Lie algebra. It closes under the Lie brackets. that's the case is because if you push forward the Lie bracket it's the Lie bracket of their push forwards I don't know if we actually covered that as an exercise or not I can't remember so that shows us that if we have uh, left invariant vector field X, left invariant vector field Y, and we form the Lie bracket, we do indeed get a left invariant vector field. I dropped the G. So we can associate in this very absolutely canonical way a vector space that forms a Lie algebra with every Lie group. So the, the input data that we had at the start was a manifold where the group actions were smooth. And the fact that the product operation is smooth immediately gives us a smooth action of G on itself, just for free. And then we can look at the vector fields that are left invariant by that action and we see that they form, a Lie, they close under this Lie bracket operation to give us something called a Lie group, a uh, Lie algebra.
these vector fields are very nice. If you exponentiate one of these vector fields, one of these left invariant vector fields, well, you get a subgroup, a one-parameter subgroup of the Lie group. So it's sort of okay to think about Lie groups as kind of like higher dimensional spheres, kind of. It's and these left invariant vector fields generate these S1 subgroups when the Lie group is compact. So we have a little exercise, very important exercise. This is really crucial for using Lie algebraism together with Lie groups. So show that there is a correspondence between the Lie algebra, these left invariant vector fields, and the tangent space at the identity of the group. And this, I think, is probably the most sort of powerful observation that makes Lie group theory extremely lovely. So we have these globally defined vector fields, x, the left invariant. But you need to know this vector everywhere on the whole Lie group. The Lie group is this high dimensional manifold. There's lots of coordinates you have to keep track of, and you have to keep track of the vector field everywhere on this manifold. It could be at every point different, right? But because it's left invariant, it turns out, no, you can actually work out this vector field with only needing a teeny bit of data. Namely, what is the vector just at the one point? Namely, the identity. So if you think of a lead group as kind of like a sphere, and you have some left invariant vector field on the Lie group. And this is, the, this is the, this point on the manifold that is the Lie group, is the identity. And you have this vector field everywhere, x, and it's left invariant. Well then, just knowing the vector field at the point at the identity allows you to infer what the vector is everywhere on the entire manifold. I mean, it's not that hard to prove, right? Because left invariance already shows you how to get the vector field, the vector everywhere. So if you've got an element of the tangent space to the identity of the, of the manifold, and you want to get an element everywhere else on the manifold, well, you've got a map to do it, right? So so given some x in T, E, G of the identity, some vector x, E, sorry. you get a vector, ah, you can get, you can define a vector field on the whole group just via left multiplication. That'll give you a vector at the tangent space to the point G. So given some very local data, so this data is just super local, right? You only have to worry about one point on the whole Lie group and one vector space tangent to it. You can get this vector space of global things of left invariant vector fields. So these, this map here, I haven't done the exercise yet, right? I have, you have to argue that this vector field that you define this way is left invariant. The other direction is super trivial, right? So to get an isomorphism, you need a one-to-one -one and onto map right, between these vector spaces. So getting a, a map from left invariant vector fields to points in the tangent space is super trivial. You just restrict to that point. But going the other way is the interesting direction. And that's where the exercise is. You have to argue that this construction 
gives you a left invariant vector field. So it's not, not the most shockingly difficult exercise, thankfully. It's just a matter of pushing through these push forwards. Actually, I think I'll stop here. So just before I do get to co adjoint, co -adjoint representations, I'll, I think I'll stop with this exercise. There's a bundle of definitions we want to get through after that. Okay, thank you very much.